universalist will be particularly how Buddhism can inform us as Unitarian Universalists. We'll continue to play what that relationship will look like as we go forward. Um, when Thomas Siddhartha had his uh, um, uh, turning experience looking up at the morning star and he wandered uh, out looking for his former companions who had wandered away when he had given up extreme privation in favor of sitting down, shutting up, and paying attention. Um, there's a, an anecdote that uh, a, a wandering mendicant saw him and realized there was something unusual about him and asked, uh, so, what are you, some kind of god? This is ancient India. That's a reasonable question. <laughs> and he said, no. And he said, well, okay, how about an angel, a deva? He said, no. He said, so who are you? And he said, I'm awake. As we know, Buddha means awake. This is a practice of awakening. He found his friends and he preached uh, um, um, the summary of what it is that he found in that uh, moment staring at the, the morning star. Often it's described as the Eightfold Noble Path. I can't remember all the seven principles. I certainly don't remember all of the eightfold path. <laughs> what I do know is that if you look at the pattern of what it is that was offered in that, there are in fact three points. And three is right about the maximum that I can hold in my, in my head heart. Uh, one has to do with in summary, we would call wisdom. Uh, it's an assertion about what the world is really like. Sometimes uh, uh, people who like words call it non-dual reality. Uh, the second uh, uh, part has to do with practice, um, with uh, the disciplines of, of awakening. And the third part is uh, how, do, how the rubber hits the road. How do we actually encounter one another, both as guidelines and also as an expression of what our deepest uh, understanding might be. So we're going to engage each of these three uh, points uh, um, to some degree. And what we'll, what we'll do is uh, um, David and I will uh, take turns introducing the subject, and then we will again, because this is a, a dialogistic practice, uh, this is an encounter, uh, um, we will break into small groups and come back and, and discuss these things in the large group as well. The, um, uh, the kickoffs, we're going to use uh, um, a, a text from Dogen and two koans. Now, Dogen, just very briefly, uh, uh, Ehe Dogen is a, a 12th century Japanese, 13th century Japanese teacher whose stature in, in Zen Buddhism, particularly the Zen Buddhism of Japan, um, is hard to overestimate. Uh, if you think of Maimonides, if you think of Augustine, if you think of Aquin Thomas Aquinas, this, these are the circles in which Dogen moves. Um, an amazing figure, and David will say a little bit more about him when we when we come to to uh, a text from his uh, um, 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 instructions on on Zen meditation, the Fukin Sazengi. The uh, other touch, and I should say that the text that we're going to use, the uh, the three here and a, a fourth one um, for tomorrow, um, we would give them to you now, but we don't want you to stop and start reading. Uh, and we know you're Unitarian Universalists, <laughs> so you absolutely would. Uh, um, at the end of our of our time together, we will have this as a, a small uh, parting gift. Uh, so the um, um, the other two uh, will will be using koan, um, koan, um, a gongan, kongan. Um, um, is, uh, comes from ancient China. The word itself uh, derive, appears to derive from the from public case as in a legal document. And it uh, reflects uh, an anecdote, a piece of poetry, uh, 
um, a longer story. Anything that uh, teachers of the Zen way have found um, directly point to some aspect of, of, our, of our human lives and, and to drive us into this real, realization of, of who we are and how we stand in this world. What I really like about it is that as scholars have begun to kind of delve into the, the, the matter of koan introspection, which is a unique discipline to the, uh, to the Zen schools, um, the Buddha didn't teach this. It, it, it emerges in, in early medieval China. The source appears to be Taoist drinking games. <laughs> and that somehow just <laughs> charms the pants off me. Um, the, what they would do is, I guess, well lubricated, uh, uh, they w somebody would start a poem, and then uh, the friend would need to match it, bringing the two parts together. You can find that in the koan practice uh, repeatedly over and over again. So the first case uh, that we will be touching on uh, um, is an illustration of the question of wisdom. It comes from an anthology of koan called The Gateless Gate, the Wumen Guan, uh, the Wumen Khan. And uh, um, uh, the 12th century is kind of an interesting, and you see time, it was compiled at that, at that period. I, um, I just love that, that era. I can recall when I was in seminary, as you can only do in graduate school, sitting around with friends and, and um, uh, um, somebody declaring, and this is in the late middle of the uh, 20th century, I am a 21st century person. And 21st century person. Mildly pretentious, but we're graduate students. Uh, uh, the person sitting immediately to our right said, me too, I'm a 21st century person. And the circle came around, and finally it landed to me, and everybody glared at me, uh, as apparently my friends frequently do. And, uh, and one said, well, we're all 21st century people, but James, we know you're actually a 19th century person. And they probably were right, but I said, no, no, 12th century. Place 35 of the woman one, uh, who is the true chimp. Uh, the case itself is simplicity. Uh, um, um, the master Wu Zhu asked, uh, 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 who is the true chimp? It's when you need the backstory on it. Uh, uh, this actually is one of those cases where an, a folk tale is simply grabbed out. It's so well known that in the anthology it was unnecessary. Uh, for us, perhaps we need to know a little bit more about it. So instead of Chin, let's say Sally. Uh, um, Sally was, uh, what's going on here? Help, help. And that will actually have something to do with the answer to the Cohen. <laughs> so uh, Sally was raised in a, um, in a fluent a rural community. Her father was a very successful merchant. Uh, and as was the case often in those situations, poor relatives would, of course, be supported. And uh, a, a cousin, uh, uh, a young boy of roughly the same age, Ralph, uh, was taken into the family. And the kids just really hit it off. They really, really got along extremely well. And at some point, uh, um, um, uh, Sally's father said, you know, when you grow up, you should, you should marry. And this is China, and this is ancient times, and uh, Sally and Ralph thought, oh, okay, we're betrothed. And in their heads, they figured they were engaged to be married at the appropriate time. And um, um, life continued. They grew up, and uh, her father, Sally's father, who, of course, was just quipping uh, um, and while wanted to make good arrangements for Ralph, was certainly not going to have a, an 
a cousin orphan be the uh, the spouse of of, of his uh, only daughter, and was in fact arranging a, a marriage with the local butcher. Or is that another story? <laughs> with some uh, a very successful and quite a bit older uh, man. Uh, he very proudly, when he concluded the, the transaction, announced this to, to the, the kids who were flummoxed. Absolutely had no clue this was coming were shocked. Um, that evening, Ralph uh, uh, decided there's just nothing to do, and he uh, gathered his his uh, possessions, such as they were, uh, threw them, uh, went down to the river, threw them into a small canoe, and climbed in. And as he was pushing off into the river to uh, to proceed further down, uh, um, heard Sally say, "Wait, wait." And Sally, uh, um, with an equally small bag of possessions, leapt into the boat. The two of them sailed down the river. They married. They had children. They prospered. Life was pretty good. But there was always this kind of nagging, longing, uh, particularly on Sally's part, for home. And uh, um, her father, who was a good, good man. Finally, uh, um, the, the young couple decided they had to go back and see if it was physically possible to make peace. And uh, when they made arrangements for the children to be cared for by friends, and they climbed in a somewhat nicer boat and paddled their way up the river. It was dusk when they arrived. They uh, uh, started up the path, and then Ralph said, you know, Sally, why don't you stay in the boat? and Let me just go ahead and make sure the, this is not going to be an ugly uh, encounter. And so uh, somewhat reluctantly, Sally sat in the boat, and Ralph went up to the, uh, to the house. Um, it seemed to have shrunk in his mind, as seems to happen for many of us in situations like this. But it was still lovely, and he recognized the trees and the plants, and it was, it was very much a, a sense of coming home. He knocked on the door, and uh, um, a somewhat older version of his uh, cousin, uncle, uh, opened the door and uh, just immediately smiled broadly and he said, Ralph, my boy, I'm so glad to see you. I, and he grabbed him and hugged him. A little surprised, but pleased, uh, uh, Ralph said, thank you, thank you. I love you so much and I'm so glad to be back, but I really thought you might be mad at us. And, uh, and her, uh, his uncle said, mad? Why would I, po how could I possibly be angry at you? And, and uh, Ralph said, for running away with Sally. And a look of complete confusion crossed uh, the old man's face. And he said, what are you talking about? He said, that night, all these years ago, we ran away. And we've married. We married. Uh, and we've had children. And we've done really well in this world. And the old man says, this is, this is not something I need to hear right now. The day that you left, Sally went to bed, and she's been in a coma ever since, upstairs. And this time, the ghost story chill ran down uh, Fred's back. They, uh, the two men thought for a moment and, and said, uh, and Ralph said, you know, I want you to meet someone. And they started down the, the path to the river. As they were about a third of the way, a, uh, uh, there, was, there was Sally uh, uh, running toward them. And, uh, 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 and they were slightly frightened, and she ran very fast, and then she ran right past them. And they turned around, and from the house, there was Sally. 
very pale and wan from having been in bed for all these many years, running as fast as she could. And the two met, they embraced, and they became one. The master Wu Zhu, many years later, says, Sally and her soul have separated. Who is the true Sally? Chin and her soul have separated. Who is the true Chin? Now, there are all sorts of ways we engage these things, and what is it that makes us uh, 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 practitioners of the Zen way uh, have to do with actually koan practice is less what you do on the pillow and more what you do in the interview room. When uh, I was, at, when I'm asked about how I did koan meditation practice, I would have to say I have no clue what you're asking about because in most in our system, after you're introduced to the the koan practice, you have to memorize cases and then um, present them to the teacher, and then you can start working on the points. And I spent most of my time trying to memorize the damn case, but I guarantee you most of them are not this short. Uh, and, and my time on the pillow for several years was memorization, uh, speaking about a practice of words. And I would go into the interview room and try and say it close enough to uh, accurate that the teacher would take mercy on me and bring up the points. Um, the practice is fully one of intimacy. The practice is fully about coming together and being present. And this becomes the question of our own lives. Where, what is it that we're about? What is the longing that brings us into this room? What is it that is divided in our own, in our own minds? This is some deep yearning that we experience. Um, if you think of, of Isis, you know, looking for the many scattered parts of Osiris. If you think of the sparks that the Gnostics are constantly questing after to return to the uh, um, um, to to the one, you can see the strength and the weakness of this longing, how we can sometimes think this true home that we're looking for is uh, someplace else, some far away heaven realm, um, um, or it's the work of gods, not of human beings. But it's really something deeply intimate. It's really something deeply personal. Uh, in my childhood, we, we moved a great deal. My father was something of a ne'er-do-well. Well, he wasn't something of a ne'er-do-well. He was a ne'er-do-well, <laughs> and I never lived any place two years running in, in my childhood. However, if I were to have a spawning ground, it would be the corner of East 14th and 98th uh, Avenues in um, East Oakland. And uh, because over the years, three or four times, we lived within a quarter mile of, of, that, of that juncture. When I um, had to go to a conference three or four or five years ago, I flew into the Oakland airport, rented a car, and I thought just as a, as a lark, I would go and look at my spawning ground and drove up to the corner of East 14th and 98th. Well, there is no East 14th. It's now called International Boulevard. That's long gone. And then I realized on each of the four corners, I had kind of a memory of buildings, but they weren't any of the buildings on any of the four corners. Uh, so what's the spawning ground for me? What is the home place for me? What is the uh, bringing of our broken hearts, of our longing, of our desire, of the hurt that we carry into this room for each of us? David will tell you. Uh, well, I, I want to invite us all to reflect. Uh, uh, I, I love so much going into this uh, topic of wisdom in a non-rational way. Uh, uh, so often we think of wisdom as something uh, we can grasp, and if only we could understand, you know, St. Thomas Aquinas, or if only we could understand James, then we would be uh, fully realized. Uh, but uh, uh, so moving into this uh, uh, 
this truly touching uh, ghost story uh, and this question of, of separation, uh, of the fact that when we speak, we can speak of a future that never comes, uh, that we can long for something that uh, seems so far off that we despair. Uh, and yet all of us have moments. Uh, uh, it could be uh, when, when your uh, uh, newest uh, grandchild is toddling around and grabs you by the leg uh, and says, Granddad, Grandma. Uh, it could be uh, when we're uh, uh, walking, out, <clears throat> walking out by the river. Uh, uh, those moments uh, when uh, things fall away. Uh, the moments when we're no longer in trouble, our life is still the same, uh, but somehow in the middle of everything, not separate from the pain and the confusion, not separate, not separating ourselves from the world, but there can be some coming together. I have not had experience in koan practice. I've read a lot. As I listen to the story, my heart leapt at the thought of Sally coming down and getting in the boat with her small bundle. And what came to me, or what's here, because it didn't come to me, what's here is my answer, which is this one, and that's all, this one. And, and all of these uh, koan, especially, are pointing to a kind of wisdom where we can easily get caught in the story. You know, and, and I think um, as you use, we may be particularly prone, uh, partly because there's such a wonderful respect for the intellect in you. It's certainly one of the things that attracted me in the first place. And so a wonderful place for thinking and reasoning and valuing it, and yet, uh, ultimately, my experience is that my prefrontal cortex cannot save me, cannot figure it out. There's always, doesn't quite make it, and, and I think, well, if I just think a little bit harder about this problem, you know, and, and, and then it, everything comes to be in the future, but this possibility that here in the moment, in an instant, without knowing, without figuring it out, beyond separating and not separating, Catherine. So, so, so it's easy to think, well, uh, wisdom is when it all comes together, and that there's some, and that's what I want to do. But I think in the story and in the, uh, in the experience of our lives, it, it doesn't stop. You know, this, this separating and this, you know, we're, we're all these different people. You know, you know, any fixed idea you have about yourself uh, or your spouse or your friends. And, and it's actually quite a bit more interesting when we realize that we don't know the other person. I mean, try this on your spouse sometime, you know, one morning. Imagine you don't actually know who he or she is. Then it gets to be kind of fun. <laughs> who are you? <laughs> and of course, the same question for ourselves. We think we know who we are. But then every once in a while, does something slip out? We say, well, that wasn't me. Well, who was it? <laughs> uh, uh, but, but then we can begin to move into a life uh, that has more freedom more possibility than in the activity. You know, that's who we are. I'm the one that held the microphone. We're going to move into this idea of practice. Uh, and again, focusing on this dance between you, you, and Buddhism, and, and particular focus on uh, what are some uh, Buddhist perspectives uh, to, to enrich and enliven uh, our you, you tradition. Uh, so this is, I'm going to read a, a passage from Dogen. How many of you have read any Dogen? It's quite a thing.
to read Dogen, because he says one thing, and then he turns it around and says, no, that's not true, and it's neither true nor not true, and by the way, it's all wrong. Uh, so, uh, uh, so uh, in a sense, almost any sentence from Dogen is, uh, is the truth, but uh, the story about Dogen is that his uh, parents died when he was quite young, and he... Uh, uh, as he saw the incense rising uh, at their funeral, he began to uh, uh, ponder what life is about. Uh, and this question about what life is about uh, is why we come together as UUs, uh, why we come together as Buddhists. Um, and uh, Dogen uh, studied Buddhism for a while, and then uh, at one point decided to make the then perilous trip to China. Uh, and his question when he went to China was, uh, if I'm already awakened, and this is the essential teaching of the Buddha in the Mahayana tradition, you're already awakened. If I'm already awakened, why don't I know it? Uh, you may wonder the same thing. I certainly do. If I'm already awakened, why, uh, you know, do, do I still get caught? Why do I still separate? If I'm already awakened, why sometimes if part of me paddling down the river and another part lying in bed complaining? Uh, uh, but but this is our experience. So so Dogen went to China and traveled around and um, uh, uh, studied with some uh, ancient masters there and eventually came back to Japan and. He is, uh, we think of him as the founder of the Soto school of uh, Zen Buddhism. Uh, in Zen, there's Soto and Rinzai. Uh, Soto tends to emphasize the, um, the, the realization of the moment, already awakened, already here. And as we sit, we manifest that. Uh, Rinzai tends to be more on the doubt side, uh, more on the what is it, and, and moving into the doubt uh, and uh, honoring these moments of insight that arise. So, so this is Dogen talking about practice and uh, talking uh, about this question of why, why should we practice uh, if we're already if we already have it? Why should we practice? So, uh, so in listening to this, um, don't. Uh, don't let your head hurt. If your head hurts, uh, bring your attention down to your heart. So sometimes we say dark to the mind and uh, light to the heart. So listen with uh, the ears of your heart. Uh, what you understand, fine. What you don't understand, fine. Uh, you've all already got an A for the course. Okay. So uh, this is from uh, one of his earliest essays, uh, Fukan Zazengi, uh, uh, recommending Zen for all people, a modest little title. Uh, he says, the real way circulates everywhere. How could it require practice or enlightenment? The real way, the true way circulates everywhere. How could it require practice or enlightenment? The essential teaching is fully available. How could effort be necessary? Furthermore, the entire mirror is free of dust. Why take steps to polish it? Nothing is separate from this very place. Nothing is separate from this very place. Why journey away? So wonderful assertion of this uh, truth that we know at some level. What, what we're looking for is here. Uh, why go on some spiritual quest when it's already here? But he goes on. He says, and yet, and yet, if you miss the mark even by a strand of hair, you are as distant as heaven from earth. If the slightest discrimination occurs, you will be lost in confusion. You could be proud of your understanding and have abundant realization or acquire outstanding wisdom and, and attain the way by clarifying the mind. Still, if you are wandering about in your head, 
you may miss the vital path of letting your body leap. You should observe the example of Buddha Shakyamuni of Jeddah Grove, who practiced sitting upright for six years, even though he was gifted with intrinsic wisdom. Still celebrated is Master Bodhidharma of the Shaolin Temple, who sat facing the wall for nine years, although he had already received the mind seal, although he had already awakened. Ancient sages were like this, who nowadays does not need to practice as they did. Ancient sages were like this, who nowadays does not need to practice as they did. So this is uh, uh, Dogen's uh, speaking to us uh, over the centuries, uh, calling out to us from the 13th century, uh, uh, calling to us to uh, practice, saying uh, as we uh, continue to do in Zen is, is uh, your mother ever tell you you can't have it both ways? Clearly, she wasn't a Zen practitioner. <laughs> you say, oh, yeah, Mom? <laughs> That's right. Emptiness and form. Form and emptiness. Uh, uh, so uh, this teaching uh, that is, is the essence, that if we are entering into uh, Buddhism, entering into Zen as self-improvement, uh, we're missing the mark. I, uh, it is clear to me that I should improve. If I were wiser, if I were more mature, if I were whatever, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't be resentful when I take the garbage out sometimes. It's really embarrassing. Here I am, Zen teacher. Sometimes I take the garbage out. I think, why can't, why do I always have to take, gar-? you know, there we go. Uh, all of us in our own way. So, uh, so this uh, teaching already awakened, and yet our experience uh, is um, so often pain and separation, uh, uh, confusion. And so we can read wonderful Zen books uh, or uh, listen to wonderful Zen talks. Uh, and uh, we say in Zen, it's like going to the restaurant and eating the menu. Uh, lovely words on the menu. Uh, but one, the waiters get incredibly upset when you do it. Uh, and two, not very nourishing. So uh, it's one of the things uh, that is so essential to Zen, uh, that this idea of practice and by practice, uh, uh, what we, uh, several different ways we talk about that, but formal practice, uh, we mean this silent sitting, uh, sitting upright, uh, uh, beginning to learn to pay attention. Uh, and when, when we teach meditation, one of the uh, one of the things we emphasize uh, so much is that uh, we're not trying to calm our minds. There are some meditations that are about calming your mind. Uh, In our Zen practice, uh, we are cultivating the capacity to be with ourselves as we are. Uh, We say sometimes we are befriending ourselves, cultivating this basic friendliness uh, towards ourselves in all our guises. So the, the Chen story is wonderful because it really names that all of us have many selves, many, many Davids. And some, some of my Davids, I think, are wonderful, you know, quite eloquent and can talk. Others are quite embarrassing, and I wish they would just stay in the closet, you know, just not bother me. Uh, but in truth, uh, uh, the whole package Uh, So how do we uh, accept ourselves? How do we learn to be with the intensity of our confusion or our doubt or our sorrow? 
and that the idea of practice is that we actually can grow in love and understanding. Uh, th there's a, a wonderful story that, uh, that my, uh, one of my teachers told me where uh, she had gone to China on a, uh, basically a Zen sightseeing tour, and uh, the last stop was on this island off the coast of China, uh, and it was a beautiful monastery, and a very old monk was there uh, who had been through the Cultural Revolution. He had been in a labor camp and uh, had escaped and uh, was here now the uh, living at this temple. And they were having tea with him, uh, and it was the afternoon, and the light was shining in and overlooking the sea. Uh, and he asked them if they had any questions. And she, being an impertinent, impertinent American, asked, so uh, what have you learned in all these years? And he thought for a moment, and uh, he said, still the same old me. Still the same old me. So this practice uh, is not about trying to be someone else. Uh, as they say, everyone else is already taken. Uh, but we can learn to be with ourselves, uh, uh, to appreciate ourselves. Uh, and then in the moment, uh, whatever arises uh, can learn to meet that in a way that uh, is neither trying to fix it, getting aggressive. Well, I don't like that part of me, and I'm going to shape you up, you know, uh, or, or the running away. Uh, you know, I just don't want to deal with this. But uh, we say sitting upright in the middle of our life. And uh, as James said, in working on these koans, in studying Zen, uh, it is not about studying the sutras. It's not about academic work. You don't uh, get uh, permission to teach by passing the written exam. Uh, it is this relational quality. And the first relation that starts is with ourselves. Uh, Dogen had this wonderful phrase. He talked about turning the light to shine within. Most of us uh, have our beam of attention uh, out in the world, looking here, there. Where is there something for me? Where can I get something? In this sitting, in this silent practice of zazen, we are turning uh, our love towards ourselves uh, as if we really cared about ourselves, uh, like we might a small child. Uh, Dogen talked about the practice of parental mind. Uh, as a parent, we can love our children, but we don't let them draw with crayons on the wall. Don't let them break the windows. Uh, so as we sit, there's some container. Uh, but the container is not about controlling. Uh, it is about learning to let whatever is present, whatever the content is, uh, uh, letting it be there. And uh, only when we know for ourselves is this a value. Uh, so, so this is the, uh, the direction of practice, of finding out for ourselves, uh, and in some ways so aligned with uh, the you, you, in terms of not taking some authority, but perhaps one step further in terms of, so you care about this, so you're curious about this, uh, uh, find out for yourself in your own experience. So in Buddha Dharma, there are a cluster of practices. Uh, many of them, I think, are potentially uh, useful to us. But I want to hold us particularly to the Zen offering, which in some ways is very simple. Um, sit down, shut up, pay attention. Um, and it turns out somewhat difficult. Uh, when when uh, Dogen alludes to, in the first paragraph there, to uh, furthermore the entire mirror is free of dust, why take steps to polish it? 
not only is that a reference to his own quest, you know, if we're in, in already intrinsically awake, why do we need to practice? Uh, um, but it also refers back to uh, the story of Wei Nang, uh, which is the the first figure, actually his teacher becomes the first figure where we start moving away from legend and myth and into uh, history, although we're still, we're still working with stories. Uh, and the story uh, that turns very much uh, for for Wei Nang is that he's a, a young peasant in the in the South, uh, and I guess the the South in China is just as bad as the South in America. Um, um, so he's a rustic hick who uh, is carrying a wood to make a living, firewood, uh, when he accidentally overhears a, a, a line from the Diamond Sutra. Uh, another one of those Prajna Paramita uh, things, and instantly wakes up. Uh, and uh, however, then he decides, well, geez, Louise, uh, what do I do next? And he thought, well, maybe I should. Uh, uh, for a little bit, he actually tries actually doing a little teaching, which is a kind of a side story that we don't dwell on very much. Realizes at some point he needs to 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 do better, and he goes and he studies. Uh, he Encounters uh, Hang Hang Jin, Hang Rin, the uh, the who's called in our tradition the fifth ancestor, um, is enrolled into the community. There's kind of a great little anecdote, but I guess the time does press. Uh, uh, he's not set to meditating. He's set to uh, cleaning rice, and. Uh, um, but incorporates into the community, and what does you know? What does he care? He's you know, got it. And finally, there's some point where there's a where they need to name a successor for for uh, Hungren, and uh, uh, because this is sort of a story and sort of history, um, um, Hungren knows that his his head monk is is got some eye but isn't really really ready uh but he doesn't know what to do so finally he says well okay i want a contest anybody can write a poem about awakening um, um uh and write it on that wall and and i will decide who who will succeed and and in the way the tale is told, the, the head monk knows that he's not really quite up to snuff, but he's under pressure, and so he finally decides to, to write a, uh, a verse. And the, a free translation is that the, the mind is like a mirror. Um, um, it sets upon a, uh, a rest. Uh, um, our practice should be to constantly polish so that no light, it's so no dust alights. Um, um, there it is. Uh, the master comes uh, in, sees it, says, oh, God, this is great. We should enshrine it. Uh, we should put a frame around it so everybody can memorize it. And he goes back into his quarters. And he says, oh, shit, what am I going to do? You know, this guy's not ready. Um, um, and such is the, the setup. When young Wei Nang sort of wanders through and he says, oh, what's the writing on the wall? He's illiterate, of course. Uh, and uh, um, a senior monk recites the verse. He says, oh, that's complete bullshit. Uh, and, oh, write this on the wall. And the free translation of that verse is, there ain't no mirror, there ain't no stand. Where the fuck is dust ever going to alight? Or something close to that. Um, the uh, abbot uh, comes in, Hong Rin, sees it, uh, says, oh, this is unmitigated garbage, erase that. By the way, who wrote it? And uh, that evening he sends for uh, uh, young uh, Wei Nang, gives him his robe and bowl and says, I don't think it's safe for you here. Leave. We set the story aside. The great dichotomy in the uh, Zen way has been between, uh, well, what is this original awakening and what is this practice, this just sitting? And you see it recapitulate constantly. There is a reference to the, 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 the Soto, the Zao Chang, Dao Chang, 
School and the uh, Lin Ji School, the Rinzai School, as uh, exponents on the one hand of Chasidic uh, silent illumination and the other of original awakening. And if you got it, here's a question. And uh, what we what we find is that in fact, whether whatever the order might be, we need both. Dogen's great realization is expressed in the um, statement that uh, um, Zazen is awakening. Uh, um, now the catch is, I know a lot of people who say, hear that phrase, you know, the Zen meditation is enlightenment, and become fetishists about posture and sitting down exactly right and getting the robes in exactly the right right drapery and assume the posture and become what in Zen is often called rice bags. Uh, uh, think tofu and chickpea bags or hamburgers and fry bags. Uh, um, kind of a waste of a good pillow. This is not a value judgment. <laughs> not a value judgment. Because, because, and the reason it's not a value judgment is that in a heartbeat, it's awakening. The question is, how, what do we bring to, the, to this that, that allows us to sit down, take the posture, and become Buddha? And, and the, the turn for us is this very simple practice of sit down, shut up, pay attention. All we need to bring into it, in addition, although addition is already kind of moving dangerous territory. We need to bring this deep curiosity. We simply need to bring the longing and the, uh, uh, the knowing of our divided hearts and this wish for home, uh, not articulated. We just need to bring it into the matter and be totally present fully as we are. As David said, the noble parts and the parts that say, why do I have to carry the garbage can out? Which interestingly happens in my house. <laughs> you should talk. Yeah, yeah. What is this? I thought I was a Zen master. Don't I get yeah. a pass on garbage cans? It turns out we don't. Yeah. And, the, and the practice that we are invited into, which I think is really right for us as Unitarian Universalists, is sit down, shut up, pay attention. You can see variations on it. I, I'm just utterly fascinated with the small group ministry, the, the chalice circles, um, in that um, it's a bait and switch. It's kind of like Zen. You know, people <laughs> come into Zen because they think they can get enlightened and, uh, or cure ulcers. And uh, the next thing they know, they're, they're dealing with great hurt and longing and desire and, and anger and uh, um, all the interesting things that make us human. Um, small group ministry, we pitch it as a good conversation. You get to go and talk. But actually, you know, when it's like nine people and you only get to speak one ninth of the time and it's pretty well monitored, even I can't be planning what I'm going to be saying next for that much time. And it turns into this, if it's really engaged um, heartfully, heartfully, it becomes a practice of presence, a practice of listening. And, and so in that sense, the practice, I think, is anything we engage in with the intention of waking up. Yeah. Many, you know, uh, threshing rice. Uh, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh is so wonderful that it's talking about washing the dishes and uh, certainly being a partner, being a parent. Is a Once upon a time, long ago, far away. The good teacher, Gautama Siddhartha, gathered the clan, and they assembled on top of Vulture Peak. He sat in a comfortable spot, surrounded in the front where the uh, animal bodhisattvas, the mice and squirrels, and then the deer and lions and tigers, the elephants. They had to keep the elephants from the mice, as it turns out. Mm -hmm. Elephants really are scared by mice, even bodhisattva elephants. Behind that, rows and rows of humans and devas and beings from other planets, uh, all the wise were gathered. And he gave his 
talk. Just a little pep speech for the, uh, uh, for the crowd to go out and save all beings. Well, Manjushri, the great bodhisattva of wisdom, was late. He had a, a business meeting at the church and had to, uh, to, to stay. When he showed up, the Buddha was still there, and there was one person left, a, a young woman, actually a kid, sitting in meditation, actually in full samadhi. And uh, um, Manjushri said to the Buddha, hey, why is it that I'm never allowed so close to you and she's sitting there right next to you in samadhi? He said, well, wake her up and ask. Bring her here. And Manjushri is a guy with a lot of tricks up his bag. And he snapped his fingers, uh, that didn't work. He uh, circumambulated her, that didn't work. He grabbed her and took her up into the seven heavens, and none of these experiences brought her out of her samadhi state. Finally, the Buddha said, getting tired of this? And Manjushri, great wisdom, said, yeah, what's the deal? He said, the Buddha, a piece of cake. And he summoned up in a moment the great bodhisattva of delusive wisdom who shot up from the seven hells through the six worlds and presented himself, made his bows to the Buddha, snapped his fingers to the, uh, the girl, who we are going to call a young woman, who instantly said, what, what? And delusive wisdom disappeared, and Manjushri said, why wasn't I able to bring her out of the samadhi state? And the Buddha said, we'll write this down and anthologize it in the woman guan as case 42 of the koans. <laughs> so uh, uh, just uh, going into a moment, all of us into meditation. So this, uh, again, another folk tale, uh, another story. Uh, Manjushri being the bodhisattva of wisdom, uh, the one who uh, cuts through delusion. This wisdom being unable uh, to uh, do something simple. And this bodhisattva of delusive wisdom, uh, able to function freely. So just noticing what arises as you uh, spend a little time with this story. So the takeaway, we hope, for this time that we shared is that failure, is that elegant performance. But I think the wisdom that we are offered in this, uh, this way that can inform us as we go forward is that as important as it is, critical, essential even, for us to see into that big space how we really are one, how we really are open, how our true nature is boundless. We can't live there. There's another uh, case, 25 in the Blue Cliff, in which uh, um, it says of this boundless space, of this openness that we work towards finding in much of our Zen practice, many of our Buddhist practices, uh, actually has no power for the way. The Zen joke is it's absolutely worthless. Uh, the great bait and switch of our, of our meditation. And we don't stop there. Many people think that the koan about uh, climbing to the top of the 100-foot pole and the invitation to step away is to step into emptiness, into boundlessness. 
In fact, the uh, um, climbing the pole is the path of, of emptiness, of opening oneself up. Um, stepping away from the pole is stepping away from the trap of emptiness. And what we're doing is we go back into our lives, into the communities we live with and serve in our various capacities. The invitation is to take that insight and to realize it is nothing less than what we're doing when we're with each other in our lives, in our separate lives. That's stepping away from the pole. That's delusive wisdom, waking up the young woman. That's finding the power out of the way in all the plays of that phrase.